Okay. Well, um, yes, Marcus has uh, told you a little bit about me. I'm a principal geologist at Oileka uh, and involved primarily in the uh, exploration activities there. I'll be pitching this um, presentation. It's sort of an industry starter level, so it might be pretty basic uh, for a lot of you who are more experienced. Uh, I'll be talking about what mineral sands are and why they're sought, where they originate and how their composition varies from place to place. Um, you can all glaze over for a bit while I talk more specifically about the chemistry of ilmenite and what the different variations are used for. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about mineral sand economics, uh, perhaps uh, about the dimensions of deposits required and uh, how the mix and assemblage of heavy minerals is important to the, the value of, of the ore. A uh, little bit about mining methods and how the minerals are separated, uh, then back up to geological settings at the end and, and some of the techniques we use. Uh, hopefully we'll be looking at about 40 minutes. We should get to know enough about mineral sands to be dangerous by the end, or perhaps enough to um, Go out and find your own ore body. Just make sure you bring it to Iluka first. All right. Um, facets of exploration is actually a good title uh, because facets as reflectors of light and crystals is a very appropriate descriptor in relation to mineral sands. Um, refractive indices and, and the scattering of light is about, is what mineral sands is all about really. The industry is a supplier of uh, feedstock minerals to the chemical industry and the main chemical industries that use mineral sands are the paint, paper, filler and ceramic glaze industries uh, and in each of those the various mineral products we supply are used as opacifiers. Now, opacifiers are minerals that because of their high refractive index are able to scatter light and reflect it back and by so doing they hide the surface underneath. Uh, exactly like that. Um, so titanium zircon they're both adjacent to group four elements on the periodic table and they both have these high refractive indexes higher even than diamond. Um, and the titanium and zirconium minerals are the chief constituents of the field called mineral sands. Uh, yeah, there's a few icons there showing some of the basic uses of the minerals, but we'll get into a bit more detail. Um, so you think titanium, zircon, you know, high-tech metals, aerospace, nuclear reactors, you know, maybe golf clubs, artificial hips. Um, but in fact, the bulk of mineral sands uh, is used for paint and paper and coatings. The, so it's probably only about less than 10% of titanium that actually makes it to titanium metal and an even smaller proportion of zirconium that ends up uh, as the metal. But if you stop and um, look around you, or maybe your kitchen or your bathroom or just the walls in the room you're in, you'll see that uh, these coatings are pretty much everywhere and you're probably in contact with titanium dioxide almost every day. Um, there is, you know, a bunch of other uses too. There is some that goes to titanium metal. It's used for things like watches and golf clubs and artificial hips or turbine blades. Um, the mineral rutile is, is used as a flux on welding rods and zircon uh, is also well used uh, for as a casting sand for casting metal. But um, the, in general, the demand for mineral sands is closely linked to construction, welding, building, and it's driven by the increases in urbanization that are going on. This worldwide drift of people from the country into the cities is quite good for mineral sands. Those new cities all need paint, they need tiles, and people want bathrooms, lots of bathrooms. 
So that's that's the minerals. Where do they come from? And, and what's the sand part of the story? Well, to match the humble uses, most mineral sands have a pretty ignominious beginning. And by that, I mean the breakdown, uh, the decomposition, the decrepitation of rocks, the weathering of rocks to detritus. Those uh, who remember their basic geology uh, will probably recognize the Goulditch tables of mineral stability. And um, you'll see that um, not all minerals are equally stable in the weathering environment. Some disappear quite quickly, fading away to uh, ghostly clays and the likes. Um, but others, the more resistate and durable minerals, um, they survive and um, they are washed out of the rocks and travel down rivers and eventually find resting places in new sediments. Um, and you know, like the man from Snowy River, the uh, resistate minerals are there riding with them at the end as, uh, as sand particles. So we have this catchphrase for these minerals, which is mineral sands. Uh, $10, by the way, is, is coincidentally around about the in-ground value where mineral sands starts to be of commercial interest. The other thing about uh, mineral sand minerals, the zircon and uh, ilmenite, titanium oxide minerals, is that they're actually heavier than most uh, of your sand. Uh, and this higher specific gravity allows them to be concentrated um, when they travel, you know, by the agents of wind and water and waves and and chiefly through the, the winnowing away of the lighter sand minerals, the quartz and the like. Uh, so, you know, we, we often hear mineral sands extended to heavy mineral sands. Um, here's some pictures I took um, from WA beaches just last week, and I think one from Sri Lanka, just very rich in mineral sands. You'll see in the middle there, the white plastic pan, that's our chief tool of trade. There's not much use for hammers in mineral sand exploration. Now, these minerals have traveled down rivers onto coastal plains and in so doing, they have a chance for the mineral assemblage to mature. And with coastal plains come coasts and on coasts, the waves of the seashore are the most uh, effective winnowers of the heavy minerals. So the best places to find mineral sand deposits are actually as beach placer deposits. But the trip they've made is important. Short rivers deriving from uplifted tectonically active mountain ranges, like on the left there, have rapid erosion and short travel and they give you a mix of minerals which has had little chance for the more resistate components to dominate in the heavy mineral assemblage. Um, they, they're often rich in what the industry calls trash minerals, things like amphiboles, metamorphic minerals like kyanite, storolite, and sillimanite. And since these orogenic belts are often volcanic, there's uh, quite commonly a lot of magnetite and titanomagnetite which is all there diluting the minerals we want and it's not readily saleable. Passive continental margins on the other hand, where slow long rivers deliver minerals onto broad coastal plains with flat stable coasts are more likely to be the places where you'll have heavy mineral assemblages that have matured by progressive weathering or abrasion away of those trash minerals. And um, there's a couple of micro pictographs to illustrate the, the changes you'll see uh, in the shot on the right. There's a lot more rutile and some of the coxine in there, uh, probably a bit of zircon, but you know, a more mature assemblage. Now the assemblage um, really depends upon the source rocks, different rock types uh, will affect the makeup of the heavy minerals that derive from them. Ilmenite 
that uh, is perhaps the most common and widespread titanium mineral. It's often associated with gneissic terrains. Um, you can get it from the more foliatic lavas. They tend to be a bit richer. Uh, rutile, in comparison, um, it's quite rare. It's, it requires much more specific pressure and temperature conditions to form. And it's likely to arise from mafic and fibrolites or maybe high grade politic metasediments. Zircon, probably 20 fold less common than ilmenite, uh, is um, more abundant in granitic terrains, particularly alkali granitic source areas. And of course, uh, I've yet to mention a small accessory mineral, usually only a percent or so of the heavy mineral assemblage, but one that's gaining increasing interest in monazite, which is a, a rare earth phosphate. Um, Aluka separated monazite, um, but mostly because it was mildly radioactive and we've sort of put it aside. Uh, and just recently we've uh, started reopening the old stockpiles because of the burgeoning demand for electric car motor magnets and the like. So the weathering and leucoxinization of ilmenite. Uh, this is the bit I was talking about where you could glaze over for a few minutes. <laughs> but there is a, a sort of continuous series of alteration from ilmenite towards uh, leucoxine. And it really, it, or revolves around the rusting, if you like, of the iron phase from FeO to Fe203. That Fe203 phase um, is a bit mobile and is able to be washed out of grains and that gives a compensatory increase in the titanium dioxide levels. Um, and with that, uh, you get changes in the color of the minerals too. Fresh black ilmenite, close to 50% TiO2. Altered ilmenite perhaps becomes a bit browner, less shiny, and sort of increases maybe to about 62%. Thereafter, we sort of start calling it uh, leucoxine. And there's a progressive increase so right up to around 90% or so, almost comparable with um, the 95% in natural brutile. Um, and of course, these different um, phases all have industry names uh, and they all relate to the uh, processes that are, are used uh, for those different minerals. So you, you have sulfate, ilmenite, chloride, ilmenite, minerals that are suitable as feedstock into synthetic rutile plants or just sold as leucoxine. <laughs> And that uh, leads me to talking about uh, pigment feedstocks because that's where our minerals go. There's two basic processes that are used um, to process titanium minerals and the ultimate aim is to produce a white pigment, titanium dioxide pigment. There's the sulfate process and the chloride process. The sulfate uh, process um, uses sulfuric acid to digest basically fresh ilmenite, low titanium ilmenite uh, feedstocks, not fedstocks. Um, the process is quite simple and relatively, the plants are relatively cheap. They do have a problem in that they produce a lot of ferrous sulfate. Uh, the chloride plants, on the other hand, um, they're a hot gas fluid bed type um, process. They start with minerals that are already high in titanium like natural rutile or um, synthetic rutile or perhaps um, titanium slag, which I'll talk about a bit more. Um, or at worst, chloride, ilmenite. These plants don't have the waste issue. So there was a bit of a trend uh, worldwide to switch from sulfate plants to chloride plants as more environmentally acceptable. Uh, that was reversed for a decade or two um, when the Chinese entered the business. 
um, they went back to the easier and cheaper technologies and the demand for sulfate type feedstocks has increased dramatically in the last decade. Uh, it's more than I think 50% of the market now. Uh, but even the Chinese are environmentally aware and, and there is a progressive move there to, to switch to chloride type plants. So what you're looking at now is a synthetic rutile plant. This is a process that is used to convert the low value ilmenites sort of thing um, that might have gone into sulfate into suitable products for the chloride process. This one I think is well, it's a couple of kilns you can see there. These are operated by Luca down at Capel. And um, they work by basically speeding up the lecoxinization process or they, they actually reduce the, the iron in the ilmenite grains to metallic iron then they oxidize that and rust it and wash it out to leave a sort of spongy mass which is called synthetic rutile and probably has 90 plus percent uh, titanium in it. Uh, another way you can go is to um, take your low value ilmenite and to put it into an electric arc furnace, continuous feed electric arc furnace like this one at Richards Bay in South Africa. Um, your ilmenite then will be, the iron will be converted into pig iron and the titanium will come off as the titanium slag, which is uh, also a suitable feedstock into chloride plants. You probably want to have uh, a lot of cheap electricity uh, nearby if you're going to do one of these. But the, uh, the reason for doing it is pretty apparent. The, if you look at these, uh, the prices relative to the TIO2 content of the different feedstocks, um, there's disproportionate value assigned to the, the higher titanium products. So um, that's a good way to get extra value. So we'll just talk a little bit about the prices of mineral sands. I've got some prices from last year. This year, there might have been some effects from COVID uh, affecting demand and the likes, but you'll see that um, the average weighted price for zircon, oh, I see I've got the uh, symbols back the front there, um, was over a thousand dollars, well over a thousand dollars and for Rutile, um, also over a thousand dollars. If we sort of look a bit more historically, you see that um, there's been a pretty steady increase in the uh, titanium minerals over the years. Zircon is a bit more up and down, uh, and there was a sort of period of volatile gyrations around the, the GFC. But uh, in recent years, um, we sort of have moved beyond the $1,000 mark a bit. Uh, the demand for these minerals um, has been growing steadily uh, over the years. And um, no sign really of, of that changing as a long-term trend. Uh, you'll also get a sense from this graph of how much more titanium is used than uh, zirconium or zircon. The zircon uh, growth looks flat in comparison and uh, probably only, um, what's that, a fifth of the current volumes that you might use for titanium minerals. Um, so you know, being larger volume things, the titanium markets tend to work more with long-term contracts, um, which customers will generally uh, stick to. The zircon markets more about um, low volume, small spot sales to a large number of, of suppliers or customers, I suppose. And various companies will uh, take different approaches to uh, 
supplying these markets. You could seek natural rutile, which is always in demand. And um, but geologically pretty rare. You could go the route uh, of converting your low value ilmenite into synthetic rutile or um, titanium slag. Uh, that costs you a bit of setup, and you probably need pretty big deposits to uh, to cover the cost of doing those things. Probably, you know, more than ten, or maybe even more than fifty million tons for a long life payback on those plants. Uh, another route is to um, focus on getting the high value byproducts that go often with the titanium minerals. Uh, you might have an ilmenite mine with high levels of rutile and zircon uh, and that can add substantially to the value of your ore. This is the sort of route that Iluka traditionally takes. Um, you can find chloride ilmenite which is perhaps a bit more valuable or, or just basic sulfate ilmenite to, to sell into the Chinese market. So bit on mining methods. Um, there's a variety of methods used. You can, you've got large dredges. They are suitable for loose, low clay sands. And by processing maybe up to 3,000 tonnes an hour, you can put some very low grade deposits through these. You'll typically find them in near coastal dune sands, uh, where you might have billions of tonnes of sand to process and quite large deposits, um, tens or even hundreds, millions of tons of heavy minerals within there. You'd be looking at sort of lower profit margins with this sort of thing, but you can have very long mine lives and you can progressively scale up your operations. And of course, you'll be a long-term consistent and reliable supplier to the markets. Um, of course, dredging isn't always applicable. It uh, becomes more complicated if your sands are very clay and particularly difficult if they're cemented uh, to any degree. Uh, higher grade deposits um, well, um, can be mined by more conventional truck and shovel type techniques. Um, Iluka does this. We've progressed more these days to a dozer push type setting where you're uh, pushing sand down into in-pit um, mining units that uh, slurry them up and pump them on. Uh, you can also see a picture there of hydraulic mining. Um, this works very well on dunal sand deposits that have uh, a lot of clay through them. Sort of thing that's done by uh, base resources. I think that pitch is from there in Kenya. And there's a, a shot of Olika's new mine at Caterby uh, with the dozer push feeding ore down into the mining unit there. So, um, Moving on to the sort of plants that would process the ore. Um, this is a picture of a what's called a wet plant from, I think this is the one at Mindery in South Australia that Australian Zircon operated. Uh, it's a nice little modular unit was able to be pulled apart and shipped across to Western Australia where I think it's now producing heavy mineral for image resources at Boon and Arang. Um, the ore that goes to these plants is, is screened of coarse pieces, usually, you know, indurated clumps of rock. Um, and then a slurry is pumped towards the wet plant. Hydrocyclones will be used to pull the clays away from, from the slurry. And they are sent out to settle usually with the addition of uh, some fo flocculent chemical. And what you will then do is produce a, a constant density bed of sand and mineral that will pass down a series of spirals 
and use the centrifugal force to move the less dense sand away from the heavy minerals. And using several passes in spirals of different profiles and flow rates and with recirculating loads, you'll, you can recover as much heavy mineral as you can from the sands. And you know, it's quite common to get you know, 80, 90% recovery. The wash sands are disposed back into the mining void, uh, often co-disposed with the slimes, the clay that was washed out from the hydro sizer. These plants um, will sit near the mine and they're usually designed to be shifted periodically, one, two or three, seldom more moves over the life of the mine, or they can move on to the next deposit like this one did. The ultimate uh, output, of course, is your heavy mineral concentrate. Uh, and you want to take this then either to port for sale or more commonly to a dry plant, which is where you will work to separate the individual minerals. I'm showing bench scale uh, equipment here. Um, magnetic separators of various styles using either permanent or electro magnets remove their iron bearing minerals, chiefly the ilmenites. And of course, as ilmenite weathers, it becomes less magnetic. So it's possible to progressively separate several different titanium phases using magnetic fields of different strengths. The most magnetic uh, material termed the primary ilmenite might be the stuff that goes to sulfate plants, or you could turn it into titanium slag and pig iron in your arc furnace. The less magnetic material needs stronger magnetic fields to pull it away and it will have a higher titanium content. So this uh, is called secondary ilmenite. This is the sort of thing that you might feed into a synthetic rutile plant or sell it as chloride ilmenite to a suitably equipped pigment producer. The, the non-magnetic phases that pass the magnets without effect uh, that'll host your more valuable constituents, your leucoxines and rutiles and zircon, uh, as well as a lot of troublesome aluminosilicates, things like kyanite that can be difficult to remove. Uh, fortunately, rutile is slightly conductive, so it will dissipate an applied electric charge, whilst zircon, for instance, retains charge. So you can use charge attraction and repulsion to direct these minerals away from one another and so separate uh, rutile and zircon products. And both wet plants and dry plants um, work best when the feed is fairly consistent because there's a lot of tuning required to make these plants work effectively. So uh, mineral sand plants tend to be quite metallurgist heavy. Uh, and of course, even when you separate the minerals, there's further considerations uh, that affect the marketing of those minerals, specifications to be met, different levels of contaminants. Um, you might have, say, chromium or niobium uh, affecting your ilmenite. Customers don't like that. Um, iron, uranium and thorium levels in zircon. Um, have to be monitored pretty carefully. As well. A little bit about Australia's role in the mineral sands industry. Here's a, a graph of uh, some pies showing where we are with the different minerals, Australia being in the brown there. And so you can see we're quite uh, a dominant player in the mineral sands industry. And in fact, um, we were one of the first countries to seriously get into mineral sands. We had post-war immigrants like Joe Pinter, who experimented with separation equipment in his backyard in Melbourne, finding ways to separate rutile and zircon. And that you know, allowed a ragtag bunch of small sand miners from the beaches of Northern New South Wales to eventually be consolidated mostly by British mining houses 
into an industry that um, came to dominate worldwide. I'd guess finding yourself working in the beaches of Byron Bay must have felt like heaven after fleeing war-torn Europe. But uh, eventually you had a closure of the mineral sands operations on the East Coast. Um, people like Hilda Felton here writing in about um, why our precious beaches were being despoiled. And that actually led to um, a shift in the industry more towards Western Australia. There's the first report of the new industry opening in 1956 down in Bunbury. So uh, a little bit about the dimensions of mineral sand ore bodies. The ore body dimensions required to host enough heavy mineral for an acceptable re positive return on the establishment costs of a mine are surprisingly large. This example shows the dimensions that you might need to generate just 3 million tonnes of contained heavy mineral at 5% average ore grades. You could have thick broad dune deposits maybe 5 to 10 kilometres in length or narrow beach places where you might need tens of kilometres in length to generate 3 million tonnes of heavy mineral. Um, the practicality of this is that strandlined or beach deposits won't usually be sufficient on their own. It's more common for a mining area to host a number of beach deposits formed at different times in close proximity, a camper deposits, if you like, formed uh, where long-lived processes have, have acted locally. And just, you know, to a set up a mineral sand mining operation cost you something somewhere between 100 and 400 million dollars. So to get uh, a reasonable return on investments of that scale, you probably don't want to look at things much smaller than about 2 million tonnes of contained heavy mineral. Uh, if you've got low ore values, you, you're probably going to need uh, even more, maybe 10 million tonnes of contained heavy mineral. So um, we'll look a little bit now at the facets of exploration. So uh, when we're looking for these uh, deposits, it's not so much the modern beaches. They're somewhat sacrosanct. People don't like seeing them disturbed or defiled. We're more looking for ancient beaches, beaches that have been stranded inland by recent or tertiary aged sea level changes or beach deposits in older sedimentary basins that the sea had departed long ago. Here's a digital terrain model from the Murray Basin uh, with some well-preserved beach ridges in the bottom left there. You'll also see a lake bed, once larger in the middle and uh, a tectonic ridge on the bottom right all with uh, windblown sand overlay. The deposit setting, those fine white black lines um, towards the top left there, that's the um, WRP deposits that were mined by Aluka. And you can see there's not much sort of geomorphic indication that they're there. So Terrain models are a very useful start, but uh, you often have to look a bit further than that. So talking about um, suitable environments for the formation of heavy mineral deposits. Um, where sea levels are rising, well, rising and falling sea levels really are the, the drivers of deposit creation. When you get a rising sea level like this, you'll tend to see that the um, beach is being eroded and sort of deposited out the back. And as the sea level rises, you, um, you'll end up with a situation like this. Thin deposits of well-sorted but only weakly mineralized sand. These um, seldom have commercial grades. And um, a lot of 
you know, a lot of smoke in these, but, you know, not much fire. You can waste a lot of time looking at this sort of thing. The place you really want to go is in the regressive uh, phase where the sea is, sea level is falling and the land is building out Um, deposits formed here obviously have a better chance of preservation and also sea level leads to reinvigoration of the drainages or sea level falls reinvigoration of the drainages behind so that older sands are now washed down to new base levels and you have uh, increased sediment supply of sand to the coast the transition point between transgression and regression term um, Tmax is a, a very good place to look. This um, transition can be slow, so the beach position can be present there for quite some time. Um, you'll also find that very often the escarpment that was cut by the um, transgressing sea is still preserved. And the Witcher and Jinjin Scarps in the Perth Basin are classic uh, examples of this. Um, here, for instance, is uh, a picture of some strained ridges in the terrain model that were left by uh, regressing shorelines. This is some of the ones that we explored recently in Kazakhstan. Uh, and here's a picture of that scarp I was talking about in Geograph Bay, the, the Witcher Scarp. Uh, you can see the black outlines of a whole bunch of mined uh, mineral sand deposits um, developed there and obviously uh, a real focus uh, at the back against the scarp in the T-max position. A uh, bit of a shout out while I'm doing, while I'm talking about these things to the, um, the SRTM shuttle digital terrain model data, um, all collected in the space of 11 days in 2000. This has become a real tool of the explorer these days. And here's a example of a whole bunch of um, depositional environments um, shown as digital terrain models that I've flung onto the page here. Storms uh, in winter, should move on, show you some more there. Uh, all these are uh, settings that would catch the eye of the mineral sand explorer. You can see some strand planes there, some erosive scarps, some maybe some deltaic development. Uh, these are the features that um, we look for as places where you might find heavy minerals. Okay, um, I'll skip ahead a bit because I think we're running behind and talk about um, beach morphology. When you hear me talk about reflective beaches in a minute or two, um, this is not what I mean, but it does show that we have nice workplaces as mineral sand geologists. And you can think about this picture when you're logging your iron colors up in the Pilbara. So wave energy affects the deposition of heavy minerals. It also affects the morphology of the beaches. Beach morphology in turn determines the capacity for the beach to generate and accumulate concentrations of heavy minerals. Steep beach profiles with reflective waves, the example shown at the bottom here, uh, are usually narrow. They have good capacity for periodic erosion and that in turn captures heavy mineral concentrations. And they can be maybe six to eight meters tall. Shallower beach profiles where waves shoal across broad zones before impacting on lower energy swash zones are di dissipative of the energy of the waves. So they have less capacity for beach erosion. The deposits uh, that form there are thinner. Maybe your beach package might be only two to four meters thick uh, in that upper case. And that I should mention though that um, near shore shoal sands can be quite broad in this case in the dissipative beach. 
and if seasonal storms are regular, then the, the deeper probing waves during the storms can actually winnow the seafloor to a degree, creating distinctive hummocky cross-stratification ripples and heavy minerals can accumulate in these. The grades don't normally achieve the levels possible on the beach, but the volume of material in the shoal banks can exceed the onshore beach environment by an order of magnitude. Um, so these, uh, there are deposits formed in this setting, the style we call WIM deposits. Um, they tend to be finer grained. There's uh, some large examples in the Southern Murray Basin and the Gippsland region in Victoria. And Iluka is um, looking into these as new development options. Tides is also worth a mention. Um, the effect of tides is, is not good. A, a greater tidal range will smear out uh, the beach over a broad zone. Um, you know, I think uh, Cable Beach up in Broome there on the left. Whereas you can see an example of a, a steeper, more reflective beach here at Men and Up down in the southwest of WA. Uh, this one actually has a lot of heavy minerals on it. The other <clears throat> point that's worth mentioning here is the effect of um, climatic or seasonal changes. Um, most beaches will have a, a sort of summer and winter profile. Uh, the storms of winter will move the sand offshore and quite often the heavy minerals that uh, are in the sand can be left on the back beach as a concentration there. This will later get buried as the north normal profile or the summer profile uh, returns and that is the basic formation process of beach placer deposits. The pictures in the bottom there um, show men and up post storm and pre storm and you can see things are much blacker post storm. So well, how do we um, spot a prospective beach horizon, which might be only two to four metres thick when we're looking at a, a big body of regressive strand plane sediment? Um, the way to do it is to look for the different fasces that uh, are generated on the beach. Here is the classic uh, beach profile picture. Lower shore face sands deposited underwater an upper shore face, the beach at, at the interface, and then the foreshore where the, those heavy minerals are deposited on the back beach and, and the dunes. If I um, compress that up for a second and we look at the pattern of grain sizes that occur, you'll see that there's a pretty distinctive finding as you go offshore quite a coarse or very coarse zone, maybe even pebbly or, or granules where the surf is um, crashing on, on the offshore bars. Beaches more typically be a medium sand and, and the stuff that blows up into the dunes is fine sand. And if you take that pattern and you um, have the land building out progressively for a series of beach positions, you end up with a sort of layer cake pattern of varying grain sizes like this. And the expected uh, beach position or the beach position itself is a, a flat layer there that's readily identifiable most easily by the fact that you have the very coarse sand layer under, underneath. So when you're drilling down through these sands, you're looking for this pattern that's guiding you to where the beaches, where the heavy minerals might be expected. The uh, those shoaly deposits I mentioned before will be down here in the just offshore positions. So Aluka assembles all this information and we use it to generate global prospectivity models, um, decide where to look. These are being continually refined and updated. Uh, I'm not going to show you them here, 
but um, there is always, you know, real world overlays to consider after that, um, whether it's practical to access or, or gain title to, to those areas that look promising. A little bit now about uh, other techniques that uh, we could use. Well, geochemistry first, mineral sands is not well disposed to geochemical prospecting, those minerals being resistate, um, show no chemical dispersion away from them. There's not really any pathfinder elements. Um, you can detect them directly, but um, yeah, you can't really use geochemistry to zone in on them. Geophysics, much more useful. Um, radiometrics, particularly, um, it's all centered around the thorium response, which is deriving from the very small amounts of monazite that might be in heavy minerals. They can give a very distinct response over an ore body, but they really only work if, if the ore body outcrops its surface. It only takes a little bit of cover to hide those responses. Aeromagnetics is also useful, the ilmenite um, being an iron bearing mineral. Um, will give a magnetic response, particularly if it's gathered in large concentrations. The grade actually needs to be pretty high um, because you're usually trying to spot the response, small response from ilmenite uh, from an underlying response due to basement rocks, which is typically much stronger and will often drown out your heavy mineral response. Fortunately, um, strand style beach deposits are quite straight and um, much straighter than, than the geology in the underlying rocks. So you can resolve them out um, by their repetition from line to line in the, the imagery. Uh, here's an example of a couple of strands in the Murray Basin, which is an area where the basement is quite deep and quiet, so it's very easy to see the strand line deposits here. Surface sampling, of course, is the other obvious way. Um, due to surface wash and localised reconcentrations of heavy minerals, um, you can often find uh, accumulations at surface. You know, it doesn't take very much grade in the subsurface to create a good showing of heavy minerals in the surface sands, particularly if you have a stream or something washing some material along. So <clears throat> we do spend a lot of time uh, out playing around in drains, uh, looking for washes of heavy minerals, collecting samples there. Uh, putting our little white plastic pans to good use. Drilling is probably the uh, chief means of mineral sand exploration. Near surface sands are shallow and, and cheap and easy to drill. Mineral sand ore bodies uh, tend to be pretty large in dimension, kilometres long and hundreds of kilometres wide. So uh, drilling a series of lines across the country will work effectively to detect these deposits. Air core drilling is the preferred technique. Uh, air core drill bits uh, cut the sand immediately from the face and they funnel it back up with the returning airstream with minimal contamination. And because mineral sand mines are near surface and open cut, they're we don't usually have to drill too deep, uh, possibly 30, 40 metres is all that's required. Um, most mineral sand deposits can't stand a lot of overburden anyway. Uh, ratios of less than three to one are preferable. Uh, richer deposit, you might be able to be mined as deep as maybe 60 metres or, and with ratios of say six to one. We will collect uh, samples Downhole, um, usually for exploration, you might start with a two meter sample interval, but uh, anytime you're measuring ore, probably one meter. You can see uh, a rotary splitter 
here below the cyclone and samples being split into those one or two kilograms is normally collected. And a couple of drill rigs, these both belong to Wallace Drilling, the inventors of the air core system. They're quite small and mobile and easy to get around. <laughs> So, um, yep, here's a picture, an older one, an older picture of a geologist working on the drill rig. I thought I would uh, just let you know the sort of information that's recorded. Uh, there's you know, estimates of the clay content of the sand, how washable it is, how sticky it is, how much is there, maybe the grain sizes of the sands. Um, the grain sizes of the heavy mineral, any induration or cement that might be present. Geologists will quite often also try and make a guess as to which facies they're in. Uh, you might log it to say, you know, dune sands or shoal sands. And it's pretty important uh, that the geologists get a good understanding of the ore body because um, Discerning those facies is very important in determining the mineralogical variation throughout the ore body. And these have to be determined because when you go ahead and create your block model ore body, the grades that are in it have to be informed of the changing mineral assembly throughout the deposit so that the proportions of different minerals in, in each area can be worked out. There's um, quite a focus on block modeling and integrating mineralogy. This is a sort of flow sheet of the typical process. So um, the drill test evaluation of these um, paleo shorelines exposes a range of deposits of varying grades and companies like Iluca usually maintain an inventory of resources. They might not all be economic at the time. Um, and it's usually important to try and exploit these deposits um, sequentially as you open up an area. So um, the establishment of the infrastructure to op to process one deposit can suddenly lead to a bunch of lesser lights in the vicinity also becoming economic. So um, basically though, for a deposit to have immediate impact, it, it will need to be uh, amongst the best that's available at the time. This will supplant others, um, may become the next development op option. So in this sense, we're uh, continually looking at deposits, but we're always looking to find the next best one. The, and you really do have to find world-class deposits to stay in the game. So as an exploration strategy, um, it's very important to be selective in, in what you, where you start the, the projects that you select to drill and to be sure that they have real commercial potential. You then sort of work through the evaluation process with the intent of getting decisive information as early as possible. Um, because if it's not going to make it as a commercial deposit, you want to be moving around the circle back into the next one. So you've always got to be selecting the best option available. And that is advice that's widely applicable, I guess, uh, in the minerals industry. And it's the point where I've chosen to stop this presentation. So um, I set out to inform industry starters about mineral sands and mineral sands exploration. I hope you've found it useful uh, or at least informative. And I guess we're open to taking questions.